Hi, I'm attorney Gregory Dell, and I'm here with attorney Rachel Alters. And in this disability insurance video, we're going to talk about long-term disability claims for OBGYNs, which is obstetrics and the practice of gynecology. And we've represented a lot of OBGYNs. And Rachel, as I was discussing with you before the video, there's some of these doctors who only do obstetrics, and there's some of these doctors that do just gynecology, and there's a lot of doctors that do both. So presents a lot of different issues that we've handled almost every different scenario um, throughout. But what's really important in, in this video and in for bringing a claim that I want to bring about is some tips for an OBGYN getting approved is that they need to understand first off that the carrier, the person who's evaluating the claim, likely doesn't really understand the demands of what an OBGYN does. Of course, Rachel, if it's a, a female claims examiner who's handling the claim, they've most likely in their life been to an OBGYN. So they have a general understanding, but they don't really know the day in, day out requirements of what an OBGYN does. So when you're helping a doctor and you're presenting this claim or dealing with a denial, how do you go about presenting the occupation and what do you like to stress when presenting the duties of an occupation of an OBGYN doctor? Yeah, well, of course, Greg, an OBGYN doctor has a very strenuous job physically, mentally. Um, it's demanding time-wise. When you're delivering babies, you have to be on call. You have to be out 24-7. So it's not only it's not a 9-to-5 job like a typical physician may have. This is a job where at 4 in the morning, you may be called in the middle of the night to come deliver a baby. You have to be alert. You have to be on. And you know most of these adjusters, they may know, but they may not really be familiar with all of the physical, mental, um, and even emotional responsibilities that these OBGYNs have in their occupation in order to be the best doctor they can. And obviously they have lives at stake. They have the mother's life as well as the baby's. So they have to be 100%. And if they're physically incapable of doing even just one of the job duties, they can't perform their occupation because they could be putting somebody's life at risk. So, you know, we can go into all the physical responsibilities of an OBGYN, there, there are so many. Well, what I, and, and, and clearly it's different if you just do obstetrics versus GYN in office practice or GYN sure. surgery, but let's talk about so that we educate an OBGYN as to what they should expect throughout this disability claim process. And starting off, Rach, you know when you represent a, um, an OBGYN, they're going to ask for their CPT codes. Explain what the disability carrier is looking for when they get these CPT reports and how they use them to define the occupational duties. Right. So what the carriers request um, from the OBGYN is they're going to want their CPT codes going back prior to them becoming disabled so that they can determine whether it's a year back or two years back so they can determine the type of procedures that the OBGYN typically is doing on a daily basis. So is this OBGYN doing, you know, um, you know, colposcopies, biopsies, or, you know, are they examining the patient? How many patients are they examining a day? If they are delivering babies, how many deliveries are they doing in a week? in a month, they want to see what the pre-disability CPT codes are showing so that they can compare them to now the OBGYN is not able to perform some or all of these duties, let's look and see what these duties are. So if they were doing, you know, um, 30 pap smears a day, now they're only able to do 10. If they were able before their disability to deliver 10 babies, in a week, now they can do one or two due to their physical disability. This is what the insurance carriers are looking for. And they want to see that there's a decrease in these material substantial duties, whether they, you know, they're, they're surgeries or they're just examinations. They want to make sure that, that this doctor actually is decreasing their, um, their procedures. So that's what they're going to do. They're going to compare that. And they're very strict. They'll look at that very carefully to make sure that, you know, that they're not just doing you know, close to or around the same amount of procedures they were doing prior to becoming disabled. So Rachel, is there a threshold? A lot of doctors we've represented and let's, you know, gynecologists, they do surgeries and or OB and they go, and, and there's been a trend over years where they stop doing OB, right. but they still do GYN. And they say, sure. you know what, I'm not doing surgery. I'm not delivering babies. 
Now, what's the percentage? What if 50% of their practice was delivering babies and now they're doing no more delivering babies and they're doing GYN and the definition of disability is unable to perform the substantial duties of your occupation. Is that OBGYN going to be considered totally disabled? That's a very good question. It's, it depends on the policy. Sometimes it even depends on the carrier. Um, they will look and say, you know, and it, it also may depend on if the delivering babies created um, a substantial amount of income for that doctor. So if not only can they not do the deliveries anymore, which was 50% of their occupational duties, but now they've lost 75% of their income because most of that money is coming in due to the delivery of babies, then yes, they may be considered totally disabled. It depends on the policy. Um, however, the insurance carriers often try to say, well, no, now you're residually disabled, not totally because you're still able to do some of the material substantial duties of your occupation. So it's a little tricky. Um, it does take a lot of, you know, sometimes fighting with the carriers to look at the, t the big picture of the doctor's practice, not just, hey, yeah, they can't do this, but now they could do all these other, uh, other procedures, but just because they can't do the deliveries, that may mean that they're totally disabled. And, and a lot of these doctors rely on that as a majority of the income that comes into their practice. So that right. it's tricky. That, that's an awesome point you have and a very important yeah. point because they can give up OB, give up surgery. And while that might have only been 25% of their time, it was 75% of their revenue. Right. So which is it? Is it a reduction in the specific duties or is there a correlation in saying, look, I gave up 25% of my time. I had a 75% reduction in my income and just doing routine office you know, exams um, I believe I'm still totally disabled. So, you know, the answer is it's very challenging, but one thing that's for certain in most policies, except for this medical occupation definition that's out there in this Northwestern mutual disability policy for doctors, there is no specific cutoff threshold for what percentage of duties do you give up or income where they go ahead and agree that you're totally disabled. And that's the battle that I, that, you know, we deal with every day. Um, Absolutely. And, so, but there is something called residual disability. Um, often the doctors would rather try to maybe do some continued work and be totally disabled as opposed to residual or partial, which says that if you're unable to do one or more of your duties and have at least a 20% loss of income, then you can get a percentage of your benefit. And very often in these policies, if you have greater than a 75% loss of income, so if you were making a hundred thousand and you go down to twenty five thousand or less then you can collect your less than twenty five thousand and still get a hundred percent of your benefit right and the issue comes with some of those is that some of the older policies we deal with is that you have to be totally disabled in order to get a lifetime benefit so sometimes if you're residually disabled you could be sacrificing a total disability benefit for lifetime which is not exactly doesn't happen in all the policies, but it happens sometimes. So yep. we talked a little bit in the beginning of this video about the occupation, and it's important that you know we're able to present that in a manner to the disability carrier where we're really we're really presenting what the doctor does and making the disability insurance company understand that. But the other important component, and probably even more important, is medical treatment and support. And doctors, unfortunately, often treat with colleagues or friends or, and, and do it off the record. Talk about why it's important to have on the record treatment and why it's important to have a history of well-documented treatment in order to get your claim approved. Yeah, Greg, that is the one of the first things I ask my clients who happen to be physicians because it is a very common practice for a doctor, number one, not to want to treat at all, um, and number two, to treat with a friend or a colleague because all day long they're in an environment with, if they work in a hospital, they have access to all kinds of physicians and they're friendly with them so they will just go for treatment pop into some doctor's office get treatment and not have any documentation and i that's the first the number one no-no in trying to get a disability claim approved is because the first thing the carrier looks for are documentation notes testing they want to see everything is written down everything's documented so i tell my clients 
please, you, you, if you want to treat with a friend, there's no problem. There's nothing in the policies against treating with friends. You can't treat with family members in a lot of policies, but friends are okay as long as they're going to treat you like a regular patient. They're going to document the, uh, the progress notes. They're going to send you for testing and they're going to put the notes, you know, all the testing results in the file. So everything is documented because if it's not documented, it didn't happen. So this is a very, very important thing and they need to treat regularly as well. You know, if we have a doctor who's treating once a year for a chronic problem that's, you know, causing them severe pain, the disability carrier is not going to look at that as, oh, well, they're only treating once a year or twice a year. They must not really be disabled. I tell my clients, make sure you're going into the office every two, three months. You're treating, even if the doctor can't do that much for your condition, we need to have documentation talking about what your restrictions and limitations are, how much pain you're in, all the issues that you're having. It, you know, it may become monotonous, but it's really important. So medical documentation is key. Um, it's got to be really well documented um, because unfortunately with a lot of these claims, your case is only as good as, as it is on paper. And if you don't have the support on paper, and I often dumb it down and say, if you don't look messed up on paper, then you're going to have a hard time getting the claim approved. And uh, along those lines, Rachel, and we talked about the CPT production, but you know, doctors have a lot of pride in what they do. They're, they're very well qualified. They've given their lives to helping other people and protecting their health, which is the most important thing in the world as far as I'm concerned. And they think that when they tell a disability carrier, look, I can't do my job anymore, that that should be it. And, and, right. and unfortunately, unfortunately, it's sad, but it's not because there's a doctor on the other side that's looking at the medical records that's basically mm -hmm. saying, I don't think your restrictions and limitations are what you say they are. And so right. the challenge comes in, Rach, is that these doctors have chronic medical issues usually, right? And they, yep. continue to, they continue to deliver babies, they continue to treat patients, and they, there's no hiding because they get the number of babies that's been delivered, they see the CPT production, they see the financials. And the disability carrier then says, look, you've been treating for a year or two, we see your diagnosis, we don't dispute it, but we don't understand how it's restricting or limiting you from doing your job because there's been no reduction. So right. how do you present the claim to the disability carrier to say, after two years of dealing with all this, this is the day that the doctor can no longer do it. And even though they did it for two years, they can't do it anymore. How do you get around that argument? It's very tricky, Greg, because like I said, a lot of these doctors, number one, this is they worked so hard to get to the point they're at. They had so much schooling. They spent hundreds of thousands of dollars to get their medical degrees, to do the residencies, training. And now they're at a point in their lives, whether you know it's been 10 years, 20 years, 30 years of practicing medicine, they no longer could do it due to their physical condition. And it's hard for them to give it up. So they will push through as, you know, for as long as possible. They'll deal with the pain, they'll take pain medication, but at some point, you know, they break and they can't do it anymore. And oftentimes I explain to them, you know, you were a superhero, but that hurt you because now the carrier is going to need to see some sort of progression in your, in your disability, in your, you know, in your condition to, to justify, hey, how come for two years you've had the same condition you've been able to practice and, and perform and, and deliver babies, but all of a sudden now you're saying you can't do it anymore. So I try and guide my claimants, you know, the doctors to speak with their physicians, tell them that their pain, be honest, you got to go in and be honest, your pain is getting worse. Um, maybe the physician can order some more, more testings and it's important for them to document that the condition is getting worse and that, you know, at a certain age, even if you've been, you know, been able to tolerate for two years or three years, this condition, as you get older, it's harder for them to tolerate. Their body is shutting down. You know, their pain threshold is not the same and it becomes unsafe. So we present it to the carrier as if, yes, you know, he's pushed as hard as he can. The condition's gotten worse. The doctors are telling him he needs to stop and it's not safe anymore for them to treat a patient because even if they're not delivering a baby, they've got somebody's life in their hands. So if they can't, you know, if they can't, like you, you know, we, we had discussed earlier before this video, if they lose feeling in their hands, they have pain in their back, they're doing an examination and they can't feel if somebody has a tumor in their uterus, you know, things are missed, that's somebody's life. 
So it has to be, we have to work along with the treating physicians and with the doctor to get them to start slowing down, um, you know, to a, to a legitimate, you know, place where they feel that they can handle comfortably to perform these procedures. And that's, you know, it's, it's tricky, but it's definitely doable. But, you know, and, and, and I want the OBGYNs to, as a claimants to understand that it comes down to credibility. And the disability carriers are not necessarily at the end of the day going to fight these cases on what your doctors say versus what their doctors say because they're not likely going to win that battle. What they're going to do is they're going to go out and they're going to video surveillance you. They're going to check all of your social media profiles. They're going to look for other things in the community to see what you're doing. They're going to look for your privileges applications. They're going to look for your malpractice applications to see if anything recently you've applied and said that you didn't have any restrictions when at the same period of time you're telling the disability company that you did have restrictions. They're going to look right. for any one inconsistency to say that, well, if you're not being 100% truthful in this one scenario, then maybe you're not being 100% truthful about your pain, your limitations, your restrictions. And that's how they try to beat you up and show that you are not credible. And, and that's what it's all about. And that's where your, you know, your lawyer comes in to advocate for you and try to protect you and educate you as to how they're going to try to beat you out of your benefits. And as you know, Rach, our job is to educate the doctors, educate our clients as to what they need to do in order to keep their benefits being paid, paid or get approved. And it's, it's a planning process and it's something you have to be aware of. Sure. So, so what I suggest for um, OBGYNs who are considering filing or if you're having an issue with your claim, you can always call Rachel, myself, any of our disability lawyers. We're going to provide you with an immediate free consultation where we will review the status of your claim, give you an opinion as to how we think we could help you. And from there, we'll let you know what our fees and costs are to represent you. I also suggest that you go to our website and you look up your disability company. And the reason I recommend that is because we want all of our clients to be educated about this disability claim process. And the more you know about your company, the more you know about other people's experiences, the more it's going to train your mind to understand how you need to talk to your doctor, how the disability carrier is looking at your claim. And the education is powerful because it prepares you to be in the best position to get approved. And that's the most important thing. Us guiding you and you being educated is going to get you to where you need to be to have your benefits approved. So we welcome you to contact us. We represent claimants all over the country. No matter where you are, it's not an issue for, for us to help you. We suggest that you subscribe to our YouTube channel because we always put out these videos. And whether you need us now or in the future, we think that the continued education about the disability process will definitely help you. We appreciate you considering our firm and we'll be here when you need us. Thank you.